Okay. Thank you. So, um, I think this time I will have enough time, so I don't have to rush. Uh, so, what we talked about this morning was basically to try to construct solutions uh, to string theory via compactification from higher dimensions and describe some general topography, if you wish, of possible solutions, especially in the context of supersymmetric ones. Um, so, it turns out that there's so many choices of the supersymmetric compactifications and fluxes and brains and all that you can put in that uh, people got dismayed. Namely, they said, okay, you can have a huge amount of choice. Which one is our universe? Forget about breaking supersymmetry. Even assuming that some high enough energy we have supersymmetry and we're just interested in that limit, that part of it. What can we do to see which one is our universe? Well, uh, they said, well, if you want to just use the base bare bones of the data of the number of generations, that gives you some amount of data. Maybe we can start with that. But even that turned out that people within that context, they found a huge number of possible solutions. And then they said, OK, well, we haven't maybe asked more. We can ask more detailed questions. Well, first they asked the number of generations. And then they maybe said, well, roughly the same gauge groups. And maybe they're roughly the same masses and roughly so the more refined questions you can ask the more difficult it becomes of course to get the point you're at in fact you could say what about the exact one we are at if you feed it in a zero solution we know the answer is first of all even if you cooked up one which was super symmetric say can you get that the answer would be probably no at least we would not be able to just off the hand say well this is that solution so people said okay this is a hopeless task let's do the opposite let's just write down the theory we want and couple it to gravity and say that's our string theory. Low energy description of string theory. In other words, so we have a map from the choice of a manifold compactification to the physics. So that's what we were discussing in the morning. You choose the manifold, you get the physics. But since there's so many choices here, you might as well say, ah, but we only have one choice here. We just live in one point there, one just our universe. You might say, forget about that. You just choose your universe, and there's some point which goes to that. What do we learn from this? We just forget about it, and we just say we have our universe, which is basically says, okay, just to take the model we are with and just couple to gravity. All this thing about string theory goes down the waist. I mean, so the whole point that string theory was predictive becomes questionable. This is not predictive, it seems, because you have too many choices. And we have one out of that, so therefore there is no prediction. And people change their view about string theory. They say, well, there's so many choices, forget about string, well, compactification, blah, blah, you just choose whatever you want. In fact, forget about string theory. Okay, that became an attitude, I'm, I'm not kidding. That became an attitude about a while ago that this is, the landscape is so big, you might as well just start with string theory. Just, sorry, the, this, the theory you want. And people basically uh, push the directions of the research to study, okay, let's talk about other questions about uh, uh, quantum gravity, for example, that string theory teaches us on. Just focus on those questions. And all the other questions like particle physics and all that, well, there's some choice, who cares? Okay, there's, there's that, that was that. Now, to this, today I want to basically argue that this, this reasoning is flawed because it turns out that the generic point you choose, the generic point you choose does not come from any compactification. And in fact, it doesn't, it's not consistent. So most, almost all choices, naive choices you pick, won't work. So the universe, or the things that are consistently coupled to gravity, are very, very special, in fact. So in other words, roughly speaking, if this is, if this is the physics, possible physics choices, that you might think is the landscape, and you say, well, whatever it is, you get from somewhere, so just study whatever you want, I would argue that, in fact, even though there might be a huge amount of things that you can get, the amount of choices compared to totality is measure zero. You have only very specific points that you can land on, not, not just arbitrary one of them. Okay? In other words, these are the string landscape. And the rest are what I would call swampland. So in other words, why are they, why are they 
why do we, do we even talk about them if they are not consistent? Well, the problem is that they are not consistent for subtle reasons that we don't know. Why? In other words, you write down a theory, effective field theory is perfectly fine, there's no anomaly or anything like that, and a normal physicist would say this is fine coupled to gravity and should be fine. It just doesn't, is not possible for some reason. Sometimes we can come up with heuristic reasons why that's not going to work. But sometimes we don't even have that. We just seem to see a pattern that certain things just don't arise in string theory. So trying to understand the criteria. So what are the criteria for swampland? How do you find something belongs to swampland or not? This is the key point. If we could find, this is what we can learn from string theory. What cannot occur? What are, not, what are ruled out? Which look, which look naively consistent from the effective field theory viewpoint. That's what, what I want to argue about. Is, that, is the question clear? Yes? So are we assuming that if it is consistent, it comes from string theory? The assumption is that string theory gives you the totality of the th theories, of course. That's the assumption. That could, you could take uh, issue with that, of course, saying, well, there might be a completely different theory which has nothing to do with string theory, which gives you another point there which I thought was not allowed. Okay. The overwhelming evidence is that this is not the case, that we are getting things from string theory, all of them in some, say, some form fit. The fact that all these different consistent supergravity theories came from get got related is an evidence already. We didn't have to work. It just worked. You just say, I want a theory with maximum supersymmetry, there's string theory. Half the supersymmetry, there's given string theory. In that case, in high dimensions, anomalies and all that fixed all the possibilities. So it was much more restrictive. But then people found them. So it could have been that, you know, there's no construction. This is one of the islands that doesn't exist. Like, originally, before the duality, if one was as courageous as we are now, pre-duality, we didn't think 11-dimensional supergravity was the effective theory of any reasonable theory because string theory would start with 10 dimensions. So people said, uh-oh, oh, well, this seems like everything that looks like supergravity, which should exist, just doesn't exist. But we learned that, in fact, string theory does have that in it. So the view is that, indeed, and the assumption in this talk for sure is that I'm going to assume that everything that you can get comes from a string compactification. It could be exotic string compactification with brains, this, that, asymmetric orbifolds, crazy things. We can do a lot of things. So one way or another should come from string theory. So, so my aim is to see, yes, Yes, I'm going to assume that. Now, the word string theory includes M theory in particular. So the word string theory, I, I'm using the broad sense that we know of today. Yes. So they, in other words, they're connected to one whole object, one whole thing. Now, it is also possible, just to, just to raise the other possible, it is possible that some particular point here maybe cannot be obtained from the, the starting points that we know of today. There's a completely different way of getting it. Nevertheless, even if that's the case, which I doubt, but may maybe I'm wrong, maybe that's possible, I think just the very fact that we can find patterns from all these different corners of string theory that certainly just doesn't arise may apply to a bigger, may, may speak to a bigger truth. That is, even if you could do somewhere else, these won't arise for nobody. So that's, that's the aim I'm taking. So indeed, it's surprising that we will find patterns. We will find, despite all these possibilities, there are certain patterns we will see which distinguishes swampland from the landscape, even though we cannot prove it. Okay, any questions? Any other questions? Okay, so I'll start with criteria. So I, I'm basically going to talk about various criteria to try to uh, say the swampland criteria. Okay, criteria, I just started listing criteria. An effective, so I'll give you an example which, which you use. An effective theory with a global symmetry, global, uh, continuous global symmetry, well, any global symmetry, continuous or not, global symmetry belongs to the strong plan. Okay, and this statement sounds outrageous. Global symmetries, we are used to the effective field theory, we always love the global symmetries. 
We're saying that if you have a global symmetry and you say, oh, just couple it to gravity, that theory doesn't exist. Okay? That's, that's the first root shock, shocking surprise. Now, this statement was actually believed before even string theory came along. And it was even before the discussion about string theory. And we had arguments for it. What was the argument? The argument was black holes. You take a black hole, and the black hole, uh, you could say, okay, if there, is, uh, if there is a charge inside, if you have some black hole with some mass, if a charged object falls into it, you cannot have, black hole has no hair, so you don't see any tagging of that, black, of that uh, charged state. And then black hole gradually evaporates, and then goes away, and you get the conservation of that charge gone. So you get the charge, a lack of charge conservation. Okay? So, so if you had a conserved charge, you would be in contradiction with Hawking's black hole picture, evaporation of black holes. So this suggests that just because of Hawking's black hole evaporation, in the context of quantum gravity, there shouldn't be a global charge. Yes? Yes, but the, the problem is that you have, you can assume that you have, uh, the information problem is that is there, but the question is what are the charges? At what level do you get charges? If you believe information is lost or not? So that's the first question. We, we, so in other words, there is information or not lost. In other words, if you can detect it somehow coming out, there's a charge you could say. But if you assume that no, indeed it's thermodyn therm therm thermodynamically radiating, there will be no information about the charge. So that's the first. So that, so that's the first information. Now, if you say, well, I believe in the information is not lost, so therefore there must be might be a way to get them. Then um, you can imagine having the charges, which are, you can actually do accounting about at which level the charges will be evaporated. So, for example, if you have light charges, they won't be evaporated, or heavy charges, they will not be evaporated until the temperature is large. So then, then there will be inconsistencies with when that charge state can come out, and so on. So there will be contradictions with one way or another. You can try to have, well, if I have a model of a global charge where the masses are this and that, whether it can happen or not. But generically, there's a problem, even if you assume the information problem is not, is information is not lost. So, there was, so this is even before whether the information puzzle is settled or not. There was an issue of whether or not you believe global charges are conserved. Uh, so which led people to believe there are no conserved global charges in gravity. And then in string theory, lo and behold, all the examples we know, global symmetries, but you thought our global turned out to be gauged. There are no global symmetries. Any symmetry is gauged. Why? Because the global symmetries only arise from, from symmetries of the internal space, but those are part of diffeomorphism, which is always gauged, because it's gravity. So as soon as you have gravity, all the global symmetries are gauged, and you're done. That's amazing. So that's, that's already says string theory is smart enough to know about this effect, in a sense. Yes? No, no, no. Even discrete ones are gauged. Even if they are discrete, they are gauged. There's no, there is no symmetry in string theory which is not gauged. It's a remarkably fa powerful statement. So this is already a criteria for the swampland. Yes? Well, effective symmet approximate symmetries are possible in string theory. That I don't have a, we don't have a problem. We're talking about the exact symmetries. So if you're asking, can there be approximate symmetries in string theory in some level, that's possible. We're talking about the exact symmetries. I'm saying exact symmetries are not possible. So all of them should be broken. So all of them... That, that's, so we are saying we don't believe in the, in the context of string theory, the global symmetries of the standard model, if any, will be there. There could be gauge, but he, we are talking about the standard model global symmetries. The global symmetries, if they are gauged, we are okay. If they are not gauged, we have a problem. That's the point. So, the, so, so that's another way of saying, if you strongly believe in the global symmetries, you better say, oh, string theory therefore predicts it's a gauge symmetry, or, or, or swampland criteria means that it must be gauged at some level. So that's the, that's the first statement. So this is kind of, you see the, it's a little murky, right? I'm giving a statement, I'm not giving a proof, okay? I gave an argument based on black hole and all that. So this is going to be the nature of this talk. That is, I'm not going to be able to prove essentially any of the criteria I'm telling you. But the patterns that emerge are consistent with all we are getting from string theory. And that's the key fact. And I will give you evidences that support the conjectures, but I won't be able to prove them. Yes? 
So the idea is that then the SM global symmetry should be broken by some UV effects. But yes. why can't I make this argument for any effective the uh, theory of the global symmetry? It should be. A any, I'm just saying any global symmetry should be broken. There's no global symmetry, period. Okay. So the point of this statement isn't that if I give you an EFT with the global symmetry, you can broken. No, if you couple the gravity. If you couple ah. Uh, otherwise, effective field theory you can perfectly write down with, without gravity. The point is, as soon as you include gravity, you're in trouble. You cannot just say, oh, take a global effective theory and just couple it to gravity. That doesn't make sense. That's the main point. So the things that an effective field theory says, of course I can. Just, just put a squirt of GR and just, just put Jimmy Nu everywhere. What's the problem with you guys? <laughs> okay? Doesn't work. Surprise. So the effective field theory, which has proven to be one of the most powerful things we learned in, effect, in field theory, is is, 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 is lame in the context of gravity. Quantum gravity says, don't go so fast. And a lot of our intuition in terms of trying to build solutions in breaking supersymmetry involved, for example, in KKLT context, involves effective field theory. Oh, sure, I can write down one. <laughs> well, can that arise? The questions are of that form. So we don't know. So the point is, don't trust the effective field theory statements when you come in the context of gravity. That's the main lesson here. So this is the first one. This we have kind of an argument which predates string theory in some sense. That uh, in some sense relates to the Hawking radiation. Example two. Our criteria two, let's say. I'll just give you some random numbering perhaps. The numbers are not that crucial. So suppose you have a U1 gate symmetry. Okay. So you look at your Hilbert space and you get some charged states which correspond to what charges you have. Of course, you have to make gauge invariant things and so on, but you know what I'm trying to say here. So like charge one, charge two, and so on. Could these charges all appear or can some of them not appear in the constant theory? Well, if you talk about quantum field theory, for sure there's no reason that all charges appear. For example, take U1 electromagnetism with no particle at all. Perfectly consistent free theory, right? F squared with nothing coupled to nothing. That's an example of a perfectly good theory. Okay? The claim is that this never happens in string theory. That is, if you have a U1 gate symmetry, all the allowed charges, integral charges, are part of the theory, are part of the spectrum. So all charges are allowed. All charges appear. So in other words, we just ruled out pure Maxwell theory. Pure Maxwell theory is not a good theory when you couple to gravity. So Einstein's theory coupled to Maxwell is ruled out by this criteria. Wow, that's strange. That's strange. We thought it was, you know, right, you know, F squared plus square root of GR. What's the problem with that? It doesn't exist. Well, why, how do I know? Well, I'll give you an argument for it. Yes? Yeah, it could be any, the charge, I didn't say massless charge, could be, I said some charge states, could be massive and whatever. <coughs> so, what is the argument for this? Well, again, black hole. Black holes <laughs> feature prominently in this discussion today. All the things that we are learning in some ways, ah, you was thinking about black hole and this does. So, black holes are a very good toy model or thought experiment in this context, more than thought experiment, that almost gives you a window into these questions. So you say, I have a quantum gravity, and I have a gate symmetry, okay? I can construct charged black holes, right? Charged black holes gives you an entropy of charged states. If Hawking's formula for the entropy of black holes is correct, area over four, since I do have charged black hole solution, I should have entropy of charged states. Okay? So there should be some charged states, at least. This shows that you cannot have pure Maxwell theory and pure gravity. It doesn't prove all the charges up here, but it does show, it goes towards showing that you cannot have no charges. Is that clear? Yes? Well, the point is that if you have quantum gravity, you can write down these solutions. So the question is, what's wrong with that solution? Unless you're saying that solution cannot be allowed. Yeah, I would say you're in a super you, you could argue that, well, how did you form this black hole in the first place? And so on. So you would have to say that 
uh, and this, would, this is why it would sound funny, you would say that in the quantum gravity, you are not allowed to sum over these configurations by hand. It's a little strange. Yeah, it's, 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 it can be pericreated, that's what I mean. So you, can, you would be saying, oh, for, so that theory is probably not unitary in some suitable sense. So you would think this is not allowed. This does not prove that all charges appear. It shows that at least some charges appear. In fact, a huge number of them because the entropy is large. But you might get still a sublattice or some subset of it. But examples in string theory has convinced us you get always all the possible charges are allowed. Again, because of gravity. Without gravity, no problem. So all charges appear. So everything that can appear will appear. That's the lesson here. Now, the U1 gate symmetry is an example, but you can have as actually brains. So you can have, instead of this, for example, some anti-symmetric form of some degree, and you can have P, P brains, and then these brains of arbitrary charge can appear. That's another extension of this. It's not just the U1, but you can actually, instead of particles, you can talk about strings or membranes. All of the allowed ones are there, will appear. Okay. Now these are some simple versions. Are there more refined versions of them? Um, uh, the answer is yes. So this is uh, uh, so far I'm trying to avoid what it means to have, for example, analog of M5 brains which are parallel and things like that. So I'm trying to form it in terms of abelian because it's hard to formulate that for non-abelian. So, uh, yes, let me just restrict to abelian. It's hard to formulate it, but there should be an analogous statement. So, um, finiteness conjectures. In any dimension, number of massless massless fields um, well I will, I will qualify this in a second is finite now what do I mean by this so let me just say more precisely in which you have Einstein's theory with an Einstein gravity Now, there are examples where you have infinitely many massless fields. For example, these Vassiliev theories. So you have this analog of these higher spin gravity with, with infinitely many analog, not just graviton, but higher and higher spin massless ones. So this is a different kind of gravity. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about ordinary Einstein theory coupled to some fine, fine number of particles, like 10 massless field, 20 massless field, etc. The claim is that for any given dimension, there's a maximum number you can have. There is a maximum, there's a uniform max. There exists a maximum number. In other words, number of massless fields cannot grow arbitrarily large. Okay? Is that, is that statement clear? Yes? I cannot tell you, but the conjecture is. Yes. That's right. There's a finite number. It's not like you can get me push it a bit. If you don't like that number, you can push it a little higher. No, there is an absolute bound that you cannot surpass. Okay. Now the evidence for this statement I will give only comes for supersymmetric cases, so I cannot be as sure as some of the other ones. So argument is based on supersymmetric examples, but I will give I give you the argument. People have given arguments based on black holes again, because uh, well, okay, let me not get into that. But uh, you can talk about evaporation and the fact that if you have a rep the number of uh, species problem, so to speak, for black holes. If a huge number of species, what happens to the black hole evaporation? People have studied it in that context and they get contradiction if it's too big. But that doesn't mean that there's necessarily a bound in that exact bound. Here I'm claiming that there is an exact bound. Yes? That's another way of saying it. So you, you would have, but I'm not talking about higher spin ones. I'm talking about mass, the number of Particles I'm talking about are mass scalar fields or gauge fields, not higher spins. That's exactly what I mean by Einstein type, not, not higher spin gravity. Yes? Is it equivalent to an upper bound uh, on the large numbers 
Yes, yes, yes. I'm exactly calling that. So the evidence for that, thank you. So the evidence for that is if you take a manifold, there's an, uh, there seems to be an upper bound for the cohomology uh, numbers of those manifolds, and now number of massless fields are related to the cohomology of the manifolds in the string compact in the supersymmetric at least compactification. You solve some equations and it gives you some cohomology elements. Is it known that's finite? No. Even for Calabia, we don't know if they are finite. In fact, that's a deep conjecture mathematics. Mathematicians know, don't know any better than us. They conjecture this is the case. They said there are all, there's a bound on the maximum number of Hodge numbers for a given Calabia dimension. What number? So don't ask me. It's just we think it's finite. Okay, that's the mathematicians conjecture. And that's what I will say that is also my conjecture or other people's physics conjecture who think that this might be a general statement for physics. I will give you one example where we actually do deeply understand this so you get the idea very clearly. You say, wait a second, the number of massless fields in the field theory can be as large as you want. Right? I mean, there's no problem. You can just take UN, large N with a large number of flavors and whatever. So take UN with N fundamentals or whatever. Huge number N you can take, as big as you want. So what's the problem? Well, I will give you an example in string theory which shows you what the problem exactly is. Namely, I will give you a field theory with arbitrary n, but I will also show you that that cannot be part of gravity. Both from string theory I will show you the argument. And the argument is very simple. It relates to what I told you this morning. Namely, we started with C2, we talked about compactivation of type 2a, let's say, on C2 mod Zn, right? The Zn that I told you about, which acted on by rotating the two planes in opposite ways. Well, if you take n large enough, you get, well, for any n, you get SUN gauge symmetry. And so this could have a huge number of gauge gluons and so on for n is large. Unbounded. So this sounds to be in contradiction with what I said. But this is field theory. It's not coupled to gravity in sixth dimension because the C2 is non-compact. If you want to compact this, you should put this inside some, some compact, in this case Calabia, like K3. It turns out once you put it in K3, the n cannot be too big. In fact, n is less than or equal to, I don't remember the exact number, but it might be 18. In that case, we can actually bound it, exactly. Okay? So, that's interesting. So that means something which is perfectly fine in a non-compact space could not be part of a compact space. Both are nice. There's nothing wrong with the statement. So it shows field theory is not unwise, it's correct. But putting to gravity means putting the whole thing into one compact ge geometry, and that becomes very restrictive suddenly. So finiteness is related to compactness. So this is deeply related to compactness of internal space. If you relax compactness, which means you're relaxing gra dynamical gravity, then there's no problem. Is that clear? Okay. Sorry, I can't hear you. Well, people, I, I don't, but people f who studied Calabia threefold and fourfold, they have come up with numbers they think is the highest bound, at least, let's say, for n equal to supersymmetry in four dimensions or something. So you could, people have come up with orders of magnitude. I don't remember the numbers, but I would say for Calabia threefolds, I would look at the Hodge numbers they have computed. That should be the largest number of vector multiples of that order, hundreds of thousands, but no more. Oh, yeah, it could be very large. Yes, yes, yes. But it's not two or three, but, but it's, not it's, not, it's not 10 to the power of 20 either. Yeah, so there's something like that. It depends on the numbers. But people have, but this, none of this is proven. It's just, it's, just the, it's just the feeling people have. Okay. So basically, another way of saying it, which was just raised, is that cohomology of a manifold of a given dimension of a good type, namely Calabia or whatever, so the ones which give you supersymmetry is finite for Calabia. Finite meaning, of course, for every manifold is finite, but I mean this finite does not depend on M, uniform finiteness. Uniform, namely independent of the choice of the manifold, just depending on D but not M. Depends on the dimension of the manifold, but not the manifold itself. Okay. 
So this was criteria I called three. Let me go to criteria four. Yes? Um, even that, in the context of 2D gravity, we can discuss whether or not what, what, is, what sense it makes. But let me restrict the attention for 2D bigger than 2. Gravity in 2 and 3 is a bit funny. So let me push the discussion to th whether or not what does it mean to have gravity in 2D is a little funny. But let's talk about higher than even 3. Let's talk about 4 and higher. So I don't have to get to that discussion. Let's, let's restrict the attention to 4 and higher. But I think we can say something also in 2 and 3, but, but I, don't, I don't want to. Uh, it's too special. Gravity in lower dimensions are very funny. So, um, so the next one is um, the following. No uh, three parameters in a quantum theory of gravity. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that any time you have a choice of parameters in the, in, the, in, the, in the Lagrangian, for the low energy Lagrangian you write, it should be viewed as an expectation value of a field. So there's no free parameter means every parameter that appears in the Lagrangian somewhere, Li, alpha i, these are, n are, not, are not parameters actually, they are verbs of some fields. It could be even discrete, but it could be also continuous. You could have discrete choices or continuous choices. There could be is there a, uh, example of discrete choices are with Stephen Whitley classes sometimes appear in in, uh, in writing the Lagrangians for gauge theory, but it's hard to write it in in a form. So there are discrete parameters in that sense. But like, what about in the theory? No, this is so the end of the gauge theory is not what I'm talking. About. I'm talking about parameters which appear in in front of terms the like coupling constants. No free c parameters, I mean coupling constants. Sorry, to be clear. No coupling constants in the theory. So for example, in string theory, the coupling constant is the web of a dilaton. That's an example. Okay, it could have been uh, just a parameter, but it's not. Okay? Now, uh, do we have a proof of this? No. Okay, we don't. But it seems to be the case. Okay, yes. Okay, so this is just a definition of a scale. It's not a, it is not a parameter in the Lagrangian. You just define the scale in the theory. Like 11-dimensional M Planck, what does that mean? It's not a parameter. So this depends on what you mean by your scale. So I would not count, count it as a parameter. Any other question? So the ratio of, so the, the ratio of scales would be meaningful. Then if you have two of them, then there's a question. Okay, now, uh, this sounds plausible from string theory. Namely, for example, anything you get in lower dimensions are geometry or compactification moduli or this and that. There's some, something having to do with the, with the property of some internal space. But, uh, but it has an amazing, uh, amazing consequence. Okay, so I already, so, so consequence, I'll just give you a consequence. Uh, well, so let me remind you what I just said. I already said that Einstein's theory, G minu, and a pure gauge theory, if you just take this, forget about supersymmetry, anything like that, this I, th I told you belongs to a swampland because there should be charged state. Right? There should be charged state. They could be massive, but there will be charged state. But Einstein's theory and Maxwell's theory could be the low energy description of a consistent theory. Right? Because those could be massive charge states, so that would be fine. So the Einstein theory and a gauge field with nothing else at the low enough mass is perfectly possible. At least we don't have an argument that's strong. Okay, so, but it's hard to assess this. I argue now that if you take the super symmetric version of this with n equal to 2, so the n equal to 2 supergravity. doesn't exist. This 
is a radical statement. N equal to 2 supergravity, just by it looks good, it's supersymmetry, what do you want? <laughs> it's nice, it has everything, people have checked that supersymmetry is preserved in Lagrangian. What do I mean it doesn't exist? Yeah, sorry, I'm talking about 4D, thank you. So just as an example, I claim this implies 4D N equal to 2 supergravity belongs to the swampland. How does that work? Well, I will give you an argument. Of course, first of all, we should assume just like th this case, there are massive particles which are electric and magnetically charged. Otherwise, the black hole entropy won't work. So let's assume there are. But could this be an effective theory just light masses degrees of freedom? I claim the answer is no. Because, well, we know there are charged states. If there were no charged states, the coupling constant for the graviton, the, sorry, gravi-photon, this n equal 2 multiplet has a graviton, gravi 2 gravitinos, and a gravi-photon, a photon. The gravi-photon is just a usual Maxwell type of thing, f mu squared, and it has a coupling constant. What is the coupling constant of that g? Well, it doesn't matter because it's pure supergravity, it doesn't couple to anything. You say it doesn't matter, you can just rescale that by rescaling a. That's not true because there are massive charged states because of the black hole argument I gave you. So the coupling constant of pure supergravity is important. You cannot just say it's irrelevant. So the question is, what is the coupling constant of a supergravity? Well, something. We don't know what it is. But then this conjecture says, aha, it can't be. It should be a web of a field. There must be at least one more field. The analog of the dilaton must be there. Therefore, this cannot exist. Pure supergravity belongs to swampland. Okay, you say, good, interesting. Can we not construct such examples in string theory? The answer is no. Each time you try to construct n equal to 2, we get extra baggage, including the scalars. Okay, so again, circumstantial evidence that string theory does not, does not give you everything you want, but sometimes it doesn't give you these kind of things, but this kind of relates to no parameter feature of the theory of quantum gravity. Yes? So, so uh, the phi's don't have to fit whose devs are the alphas, those fields, they don't have to be massless. Right? You can argue from the Lagrangian that this should be, if there is a field, oh, okay. it, in this case it has to be a massless. In, in general, they don't have That's to. right. That's right. Okay, so that's, that's another example. So this is kind of a lower bound. This was kind of an upper bound. I said the number of fields cannot be infinitely big. Here I said they cannot be infinitely, infinitesimally small. It cannot be zero. So it's kind of, you're, you're, you're actually saying something in both directions. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see, I should have pushed this up. Now, suppose, uh, as it happens in supersymmetric compactivation of string theory, Suppose you have got some extra parameters in your theory, which are scalar webs, like the phi's I told you about. So typically, there will be some massless fields which, uh, which appear in the Lagrangian. Sorry, Gij. So you have some kind of Lagrangian like this for massless fields whose web determine the radii or the shape of your manifold and so forth. These are called the moduli of the compactification of the string. So there's typically some space, we call this curly M, we call it the marginalized space of compactification, which is basically the space of all these expectation values. So there's some space. Like this. Well, except I'm going to, in a second, say this is a very bad drawing. <laughs> Namely, I have drawn something which looks compact. Okay? The conjecture is, First of all, for every point you choose here, if you choose a point P0 somewhere, suppose you're trying to find the point some distance away. For first of all, what I mean by distance? Well, the distance is measured with respect to the metric, which is part of the definition of the effective field theory that you get for these massless fields. So there's a metric on this marginalized space. So you measure a distance using this metric between any point and any other point. The shortest path you can get to it. Okay, fine. Could this be as big as you want? Or is it finite? 
Okay? If it is finite, in some sense that means the marginalized space is compact. Right? You cannot go infinitely far away. There's always somewhere you can it's not could it be like a sphere or is it really long or something? The statement is always non compact. That is, for every t you choose, for every distance t you choose, there exists a p such that the distance of p p naught to p is bigger than t. For all t. Okay? Why do we say that? Well, it just happens to be in all examples in string theory we know this is true. But there is actually more to this, which is what I want to say. I stopped, I stopped giving numbers here. Let me call this number five. So six is, yes? Yeah, the runaway is part of this story. I, I'm exactly coming to that runaway feature. So the statement is, not only there is, but suppose you change, choose t to be larger and larger. So since for every t, there's at least some p that's that far away. So take the extreme limit as t goes to infinity. Then the claim is, the theory will have light degrees of freedom. So those are the corners where some light degrees of freedom come down. So the claim is that there would be mass, as t goes to infinity, there will be some massive states whose mass goes like e to the minus alpha t for some alpha. This is a conjecture, of course. I claim that this conjecture implies the quantum gravity has extended objects. Such as sem membranes or strings. It cannot be a theory of particles, I claim. This criteria implies it cannot be a theory of particles. I'm going to show you now. The number of dimensions I'm not talking about, of course. But it's bounded, the dimension, because it's the homology of the manifold. Oh, of a given one. You start with a given compactification, you're looking at one of them. And for this one of them, there will be extreme points. So, so what happens typically is that the marginalized spaces will look like these. So you'll be some point here. And then there will be these directions that you can go off to infinity, which are these t's. And the main point is that you get light states here. Now, this picture looks familiar indeed, right? This is the usual picture people draw for duality web when they want to talk about it. What are they drawing? Well, they're drawing some parameters like circle, size of circles or compactification. And various corners, you get some decompactification of the theory this way or that way, where you always get some light states. That's what this theory, this is telling you about. Sorry? You ca I cannot hear you. You cannot recognize? Stabilize. Well, these are all, it could be massless I'm talking about. So far I'm talking about this massless here. I'm just talking about in a case where, for example, you have supersymmetry. You can have massless moduli. So yes, you haven't stabilized it because you have a marginal direction. You can go anywhere you want. So I'm talking about those cases. But I'm saying if you change the, mar the expectation value, the radii, for example, this is, remember, each point is the choice of a radii of the Calabia or something. No matter which direction you choose, their extreme cases are the cases where you get light states. There are, and there always are such points. You will always have points where there are light states. And, uh, yes? This would be, this is some of the issues that people in inflation, if they want to have, depends on what you want in inflation. So if you have infinitely long, so, so, uh, so let me say, they don't want to get light states. 
they want to have a large distance. This part, they like conjecture 5, they don't like conjecture 6. They want to have points which are far away so you can go as long as you want, but they don't want to go get light states because that would ruin their inflation. Yeah, so this, is, this is, tells you that inflation is not as easy as people think there is. String theory will be against it. Again, they would say, what is the problem with you? Just write down an effective field theory, it's okay. <laughs> so this is precisely the modality of thinking, that effective field theory is not the correct guide for quantum gravity. So I will now, in a sense, so this is known in all the examples we know in string theory. I cannot tell you the precise alpha, and I cannot tell you the, you know, the, the exact things, but this, is, this general feature persists in all examples we know. Yes. What are the effective fields that I cannot write down? Well, suppose you take, by five, just take, suppose you have a marginalized space which is given by a sphere. Sphere has maximum distance, you go from one side to the other. So this is already obstructed, five says no, it cannot be. So sphere cannot be a marginalized space of any, any good compactivation string theory. So in other words, there's, there's always these punctures. There's all these, these points that you can ru run away points. And these run away points are points where weak coupling sometimes emerges, sometimes exotic physics arises, but you always get light states. Let me actually demystify this by giving you an example. <coughs> Compactify the theory on a circle of radius r. This theory will have a modulus, which is this radius modulus, part of the gravity degrees of freedom, which has a scalar Lagrangian like this. If you write down the effective theory for the radius in one lower dimension, you always get this term. Okay? Now, this shows the fact that they're infinite distance away. Namely, if you start with a given distance, the metric is just, uh, so the distance, sorry, distance is integral of dr over r from r to some point. So if you go, for example, r to infinity, so from r naught to infinity, this is infinite. Good. This is an example of the statement. This is an example of conjecture 5, right? And what about conjecture 6? Conjecture 6 tells you, well, if the radius gets bigger and bigger, you get kk modes, one over, whose mass goes like 1 over r. Right? But 1 over r, you can see from this point, is related to the log of the, if this is, I'm calling t, so the, the r, the cutoff that you're putting, log of that cutoff goes like t, so the mass goes like 1 over r, goes like e to the minus t. And that's giving you the statement of conjecture number 6, that you get light state, kk modes. Okay? Now, I claim conjecture 6 also implies that you must have extended objects. How does that follow? I claim from this example you can see it. Can anyone tell me why? You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying which theory it is. You're assuming a string theory. I'm just saying this criteria, in any, if it's true in any quantum gravity theory, that quantum gravity theory must have extended objects. Well, the argument is, here I went from R equals to R naught to infinity, right? I could have gone the other way, towards zero. <laughs> if I went towards zero, that's also give you infinite distance. And according to this conjecture, there should be a light state arising as r goes to zero. But if, if you have an effective field theory with no extended objects, as r goes to zero, the kk mode become infinitely heavy, and you can throw them away. And there's no light state at all. So without extended objects, you will not get light states. So the fact that as r goes to zero, you should get light state must be that you have something wrapping this. Otherwise, you won't get light states. Is that clear? So this tells you that this criteria really is a crucial for telling you that you have a theory of extended objects, which is fundamental to string theory, but that this is turning it around 
from one criteria, you can actually deduce there better be extended objects. Okay. Yes? I, I don't know what the alpha is. In other words, it, dep it could, in other words, I know, I don't know, I mean, it might depend on example. It's not universal, I mean. It's some, some number, depends on the manifold and depends on the rest of the detail of compactification. I don't know. The question, Satan is that there's some alpha. In this case, alpha was one, the one I just told you. But it could be different in different cases. Uh, conjecture number five. Oh, not five, sorry, conjecture number seven. Yes, I'm running out of numbers, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> No, so for example, uh, not necessarily. It just says that there should be something going on. Uh, for example, here R goes to zero. Here is equivalent to R goes to infinity in, that, in the T-dual version, but sometimes it's not the case. For example, in M-theory, it goes down in dimension. In the other one, it doesn't go down in dimension. So if it is M-theory, you go from 11 to 10 if you go down to zero size. And the, so the light degree of freedom is the string, right? You have membrane, M2 brain wrapped around the circle becomes a light state. I'm not, we are not, I'm not making that. You can try to add that statement, but then you have to think about what dimension means. Yes. You can try to, you can try to refine these conjectures. I'm not, I'm not saying this is the only kind of thing you can write down. This is a conjecture. You can try to add bells and whistles to it. That might still be an extension of the conjecture. That's possible. You might say some of the directions increase dimension, sometimes don't. But there are cases where sometimes it doesn't change dimension. Sorry, S1 is shrinking. That much we know. You start, I'm just saying, suppose you take the theory in whatever dimension you have and you go one lower dimension as S1 is shrinking. Do you get light state as S1 is zero size or not? That so we're applying that argument. We start with some theory. We compact the That's right. And we apply that That's right. Yes. Which one? No, this is a massive. That's right. And they're not particles. They're mass, mass scales. Like in strings, I call it mass scale of the string. So it's not just particles. <coughs> okay, so um, there's another conjecture. Let me just write down. I, I just better, I thought I'm going to have a lot of time. For some reason, I'm, I'm now halfway. <laughs> Okay, um, the next one I'll just state it, but I won't give you any examples. I'll just state it as conjecture seven. The moduli spaces I, I just discussed, they have these corners, like these points that they run into infinity. But if you ignore those, if you compactify them, has vanishing pi one, has is simply connected. For example, if it's two dimensional, it's always a sphere. Of course, it's a sphere with punctures in this case, because you know that there are, there are points where they run away to infinity, but topologically it's a sphere other than these punctures. We don't have a proof, but this seems to be the case. And an example of this is moonshine. You heard about moonshine? Did, they, did, did Miranda tell you about the fact that the fundamental group of them turns out to be these uh, the extensions of a uh, modular group uh, with tricky element or not? That's not discussed. Okay, anyhow, those are very interesting examples which turn out to have interesting genus zero properties. It's one of the amazing properties of the moonshine. This has to do with some, some aspects where translates to this language where marginalized space is genus zero. It's quite some surprising. And this again, so this might be related to the fact that if it wasn't zero, you can form a black hole by having a charge with that fundamental group, but that's, there's, no, there's no gate symmetry associated with it, so you can create a global charge if the fundamental group was not zero. 
So the gauge, global charge, is the issue here. But again, there's no direct proof of that. And so then I want to come to the next set of examples, which is basically the main thing I'm going to talk about next, is the so-called weak gravity conjecture. And this is, I guess, item number eight. This is basically the statement that the gravity is the weakest force. Is always the weakest force. Okay, so what that statement means is that um, I will just give you in a particular context. This can be generalized on this and that, but I will just give you in a very specific context. So So suppose you have a U1 gauge theory. So let me just, for, for concreteness, talk about 4D theories with a U1 gauge theory. Very simple. OK. We already used conjecture number, whatever it was, 2 or whatever it was, that there must be a charged state, right? Because it's U1, this quantum gravity U1. Look at the lightest charged state. OK. Let's call that call charge Q. What, suppose you have two of these objects next to each other. What is the force between them? Well, it's Q squared over R squared repulsion. Right? But then there's an attractive force, which is m squared over m Planck squared times r squared. That's the repulsion force. Sorry, attractive force of the gravity. The claim is that the gravity force is always weaker than the repulsion force. Okay? In other words, m in Planck units is less than Q. Okay. Why is that? Well, it's true for our universe. Look at the electron. <laughs> the force of the repulsion between two electrons is far more than the gravitational uh, attraction they experience. You can ignore the gravity. It turns out in all string theory, this is the case. What, what happens? Well, it turns out when you try to violate this, it turns out you can try to violate this. You start with a compactification, and you say, okay, I tried to violate it. You find, oh, I found a way to violate it. I have to make this internal manifold smaller and smaller. You make it smaller and smaller, you come close to violating this thing, and then as soon as you're there, then there's extra degrees of freedom come in, and the description breaks down. So each time you try to violate it, you get some problems. So at any region you're talking about which is reliable, you always end up with satisfying this bound. Oh, good question. I'll come to the equality sign in a second. Um, let, me, let me for now say less than or equal to, and then I'll, I'll sharpen the weak gravity conjecture in a second. So here is less than or equal to. We know that equality can happen. In fact, BPS states are, BP, are exactly the same example of equality. So if you have a supersymmetric theory, and these are BPS states, then M is equal to exactly Q. So, so less than Q is, 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 is the inequality sign. Yes, I know. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Yes. I, I will give you examples about this. It's very unintuitive from that viewpoint. I agree, Miriam. But I'll try to give evidence for this. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about the charged particles. I'm saying for there, for there's a, there is a charged particles for which m is less than q. Sufficiently low mass. Yes. Every BPS state will be equal, but here's m is less than q. So what's the argument? Again, black holes. These black holes feature prominently. The idea starts by saying, and you can view this as conjecture number 9, uh, if you wish, or, or, or maybe 8 prime, a slightly extended conjecture. All extremal black holes all black holes decay. All black holes decay. Except uh, supersymmetric ones. So except for this very extreme case, which happens to be my favorite in some sense, every other one decays away. So the black holes are just there to decay. 
Now, so let's assume that's the case and apply it to the extremal ones. There are extremal black holes. So the extremal black holes satisfy m equals to q. At least for large enough q, when it classically satisfies m equals to q. So this extremal black hole, so these exist. So it's a huge black hole with m is very large. Now, this conjecture says that all, all of them will decay. Let's say it's not supersymmetric, so they actually decay. Well, how could they decay? Well, they have to emit particles, it's tiny masses and tiny charges. They gradually decay according to Hawking radiation, so they take away mass and charge gradually. Suppose your, the masses that you end up having are always bigger than charge. Suppose. Well, there's a conservation of mass and charge. This will give you that the mass that you're left up with satisfies this less than the charge. Because if this is true for the emissions, the leftover black hole momentarily later, a moment later, satisfies this bound. This violates the bound from black holes, which tells you that m is always bigger than or equal to q. Extremal black hole is the lower bound on the mass. So the things that you can emit should be opposite in order for it to not, not violate. Okay? So the extremal black holes decaying lend support to the idea of this weak gravity conjecture. Yes? Um, let's see. Um, binding energies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about infinitely far away, basically. Yeah, anyhow, I don't claim that this proves that. So let me just say, this, is, this lends support to that. I didn't say this is equivalent or anything. So this is an idea which, which underlies part of the motivation. But another motivation is that we just cannot get anything like this from, in string theory, it always is like that. So gravity is the weakest force. Um, okay, good. Um, actually, this is very interesting because it tells you that if you have a uh, if you have a gravity theory with some mass m Planck and some charge g, the analog of the q. So if, suppose you have a u1 gauge theory with charge g, and you have m Planck in that quantum gravity, u1 coupled to gravity then there must be a state whose mass is less than or equal to that. This is just this, I'm just rewriting this. But this must say that if you don't encounter any mass scale, at least when you get to g times m Planck, there's some light state, charge state. So this tells you that there's a new scale in the theory. So if you have a theory of gravity, if you have a u1 theory, there is another scale which is g times m Planck. This sounds very much like unification this process we have. We have m Planck, and slightly below it, we have this other thing where the gauge forces get charge state, light states, and so on. So this is a general feature of that conjecture. Just this, this m is less than or equal to charges partly implies you'll always encounter this near where the m Planck is, related by some coupling constant order smaller, you'll get some mass scales. You should get some mass scales. That's, and that's indeed exam, uh, very nicely satisfied in string theory, like in hydraulic strings. Hydraulic strings, you have a U1 or bunches of U1s, and then you have a Planck scale, and you have a string scale. The string scale, where the, electric, the electrically charged states are, have masses, turns out to be exactly the scale given by G times M Planck. So you have two scales when you have this electrical charge style. You have two scales, the string scale and the Planck scale. That's an example. This extends to the brains. The extension to the brain is that if you have brains, you put them parallel to each other, the repulsion force wins over the attraction force. Okay, so that's generalization of this. You can apply it through brains. Uh, I'll give you an example, which is, as Miriam said, this is very unintuitive. And I think if it weren't for this concrete example, we would not have made it. So because it's typically we say equal, give me an example where it's less than explicitly in string theory. And I will give you that example now so you actually get convinced that it's actually a non-trivial setup. So, so the example actually you're all familiar with is heterotic strings on tori. 
So you take hydraulic string and you compactify on a d-dimensional torus. And as you know, you get the Narayan lattice, which gives you a, uh, you give you a configuration of the momentum and windings for the hydraulic strings. And as you know, they, there's a mass relation, which satisfies one half of the mass states for the strings. String perturbation gives you this formula, one half p left squared plus n left minus one is equal to one half p right squared plus n right minus one, uh, plus nothing, nothing, plus one, no, sorry, supersymmetric side, nothing, right? So you have this relation. I claim, and I will show you in a second, that this minus one is related to this inequality sign. So the familiar tachyon for the hydraulic string, this minus one, which you are familiar with from the left movers of hydraulic string, realizes the inequality sign. In a second, I will show you. How does that work? Well, let's talk about first about supersymmetric BPS states. These are states which satisfy right mover oscillators equal to zero. These are the so-called the Dabolkar Harvey states. So the Dabolkar Harvey states are BPS and supersymmetric. And as you can see, if n right is zero, you learn that m squared is p right squared. And p right characterizes the corresponding, what I'm calling the analog of the u1 charge. So this is the analog of m equals to q, where the q is basically this absolute value of pr. Okay, so this is the BPS condition. m is pr. This is good. So this is the equality sign for BPS states. However, you can talk about the non-supersymmetric state by reversing the question. Let's look at the case where n left is zero. So if n left is zero, then you're going to get a situation which is not supersymmetric. And when you do that, you get states which have m squared is equal to one half m squared is one half p left squared minus one. This is the analog of a charge. So if you look at the charge which are of the form p left comma zero, the charge is given exactly by p left, and you find that the mass is less than the absolute value of p left. In other words, you get inequality for non-BPS states. And this is, this is exactly the analog of the states we're talking about. Now, there is a sharpened, ver there's a sharpened version of the weak gravity conjecture, which says that the equality sign happens, m is, the, m is less than, m is equal to q, if and only if, if and only if, the underlying theory is supersymmetric, and this is protected by BPS condition of that supersymmetric algebra. Okay? It doesn't sound exotic. It sounds reasonable. The only reason why would you go all the way close to that thing is this good reason. Well, okay, supersymmetry. Okay? If you assume that, then it in implies, at least you can say that's the next country. So that's the sharpened version. Let me call it, the sharpened version is 9. You can sharpen it. Sharpen WGC. And then you can go to 10. Non-supersymmetric ADS, non-supersymmetric ADS holography, ADS-CFD holography, belongs to the swamp plan. Now, this is a radical statement. <laughs> People are spending a lot of time constructing uh, non-supersymmetric holography. This is not to say non-supersymmetric holography doesn't make sense. It does make sense. The claim is, the claim is that if you want to have a non-supersymmetric ADS-CFT holography, it doesn't make sense if you have finite number of particles. Now, you can have versions like in SYK where you have infinite tower of particles, like order one mass states. Those I'm not talking about. I'm talking about things which you can have distinguished gap, what's called a mass gap. Like in ADS 5 times S5, you have the analog of the mass gap where the massive states are, have picked up a huge mass so you can distinguish gravity from the rest of the degrees of freedom. For those cases, you have supersymmetric holography, no problem. The claim is that if you have a non-supersymmetric one, it doesn't work. Why is that? The motivation is actually very simple. It just follows from this picture. Well, how do we get holography? You just put brains and string theory next to each other and go to the near horizon geometry, right? 
But guess what? If it's not supersymmetric, the repulsion wins over attraction. You can't stay, you can't put the brains parallel to each other, that's all. So the weak gravity conjecture, sharpened version says in the non-supersymmetric setup, they will fly apart. Okay? So, and in all the examples we know, when you try to actually construct non-supersymmetric holography, you will actually find this happens. And I'll give, you, I'll give you another example of it. So a very simple example is in two dimensions, two-dimensional CFD. So a, a very beautiful example is a symmetric product of K3. If you take sigma models on supersymmetric products of K3, this is an example where the holographic dual is ADS3 times S3 times K3. Very nice example. It is supersymmetric holography. However, how does it start with? Well, you take K3 and take symmetric product orbifold. And you can do that easily, construct it, and you say, wait a second, why am I doing non supersymmetric What if I did non supersymmetric version of exactly that? Or, for example, symmetric part of tor tori, for example. If I take symmetric part of tori, again, I get an orbifold. No problem. There's a 2D CFD, which is symmetric part of T4s, with no fermions. What's the problem? The problem is, in order to get the limit where the, the light degrees of freedom has disappeared, in the ADS3 times S3 times K3 case, you have to blow up the modes where when you take the symmetric products of 2K3, two points come to close together, you have a Z2 identification between them, it's singular, you blow it up. You have to blow it up in order to get rid of this light degrees of freedom. Once you do that, you get ADS3 times S3 times K3. You cannot do it in the non supersymmetric case because the marginal deformation does not exist. That deformation was marginal only in the supersymmetric case. So the supersymmetric holography doesn't exist. Of course, you see, conformal theories are perfectly fine. Super symmetric products of T4 is fine. It just doesn't allow you to go away from that point. Okay? So an example of this in the context of SYK is that if you try to get, you get infinite tower of states, you could say, well, can I adjust the potentials in the SYK model to get rid of this tower of states? And nobody has managed to do that. So, so you always get this tower of states. So this is, holography does make sense for non supersymmetric case. It just doesn't give you something which we talk about gravity with, mod, with mass gap, basically. That's the, that's the issue. Um, finally, uh, in the last, uh, oh, before I say that, there has been actually a striking, uh, striking example for weak gravity conjecture recently by work by, uh, by Stan, uh, uh, Jorge Santos and, and his student, Chris Ford, where they showed that um, uh, the following. They said, take Einstein-Maxwell theory, combine, and solve, study the mechanics of ADS, and they found interesting solutions. And they, they found that if you crank up the electrical field, you can create a naked singularity. That's unfortunate, because people thought naked singularity should not be allowed in gravity theory, but they could easily do it. Well, uh, what's the problem? Well, let's analyze it from a string theory's viewpoint. You take electromagnetism and gravity. You then say, ah, we learned in this lecture, he was telling us, there's massive, there's, there's charged states. Otherwise, it's swampland. Okay, so there must be charged state. They were not talking about charged state. But they had to crank up their electrical field. Oh, I see. You then will create charged particles. Charged particles whose mass is less than Q by this relation. So... So this turns out to, seems to actually evade this problem. That is, when they try to create this naked singularity, because of the weak gravity conjecture, you will always have these mass states which are light enough to create, uh, to, you generate these states, which then create a black hole surrounding the naked singularity, the singularity then becomes, uh, behind, goes behind the horizon. And therefore, you would not get a naked singularity. So this actually supports both the weak gravity conjecture and the cosmic censorship, that you cannot see a naked singularity. So this is quite an interesting connection between two apparently completely unrelated statements. So it re reinforces both. So uh, finally, the last few minutes, I want to tell you about the non-supersymmetric uh, case, where uh, I said that lambda less than zero ADS, in other words, does not get you supersymmetric ones. Sorry, does not have a non-supersymmetric one. So there's no. So this cannot be non-supersymmetric. Non-SUSI is not allowed. You can only have SUSI, and that we know, of course. The ADSs are examples. ADS five times S five, for example, and so on, 
are all like this. Lambda bigger than zero, su z is not allowed. We know it's not allowed because of very simple arguments based on supersymmetry, just not allowed. So then you might hope that maybe there is non su z is, is allowed. So you might think that lambda is positive is where the non supersymmetric stuff lives, like us, like our universe. Lambda is positive. What's the problem? Well, we don't know. We don't know because we haven't been able to find. Uh, so typically the picture is that you have some metastable vacuum with positive lambda, which could be that. Effective field theory, no problem. You can easily write it down. To actually construct it, I would love to hear it if you find one. Reliably computable, find one. Namely, find one which absolutely has no moduli, which you can turn, turn around. In fact, in all the examples I, I have actually managed to analytically study, you can have positive lambda, but it always is a runaway direction. There's always some runaway direction. Now, this may be our universe for all I know. Namely, it could be that our universe is like this if it's sufficiently slow roll towards the supersymmetric one. So there's, this is quintessence models that we will talk about is of this type, not of that type. So I'm saying that it's possible that quintessence is the more favored one. We don't know yet. Um, there is a bias in our community for the metastable one because we think you know, the sitter is like that. But now let me give you an argument against that. It it's, uh, actually solves another problem. If it is indeed of this form, and if this lifetime is not sufficiently long, it actually is consistent with the following fact. We live in a universe right now which is about 14 billion years, but there is a natural scale associated to the, uh, to the cosmological constant that we would have measured. The lambda that we measured, the cosmological constant, gives you a scale, the Hubble scale. And the Hubble scale that corresponds to a time scale which is about 100 billion years. Okay. Now, why is it that the age we live in is so close to that 100 billion years? If you are in this scenario, it is very bizarre because this could be very long-lived because you could have a situation where the decay time is very, very, very... takes a long time if it's sufficiently made stable. But the fact that our lifetime, our current age of the universe is so close to the Hubble scale, and this is what's called the, one of the things that people call coincidence problem, the fact that it's so close might be explained by the fact that you always will run away. It's not, you cannot stabilize the period. It could be that our universe is like that. So we are actually just studying this kind of question right now and uh, with, with, with a number of people. We don't know the answer, but I think it's crucial to come up with techniques to actually study reliable, computable examples within string theory to know if we can, if we can have this or, or of this type. And if we are in this situation, can we estimate the lifetime of that universe? Is that related to the Hubble scale? Those are the kind of questions that could be very interesting. If it's like this case, maybe we are in a teenager in a, in a hundred year old <laughs> life that we have. So enjoy it while it lasts, so to speak. Um, so... Well, there is, there is a st instability like rolling, I mean. Not... not Very small, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not saying that you don't have to have fine tuning, but there should be some. So the question is whether you can construct it, whether there's any relation. There, there, there are fine tunings are all over the place. Namely, the cosmological constant is already fine tuned. Yes, exactly. yes. So this may be another, this may be related. In other words, it might be the saying, oh, if you take lambs will be this small, then that's already fine tuned that. I don't know. We don't know enough about these kind of examples to know whether or not you can do it or not. The main point I'm trying to make. We should study from string theory techniques of this type, uh, examples of this type to see whether, what we can do. I'll give you just one example. Take type 2b with a D9 and an anti-D9 brain. Okay, it's not supersymmetric and they annihilate each other. Okay, can you estimate this lifetime? Well, if G string is sufficiently small, we should be able to estimate it. And we can estimate it. How long does it take? And we have, that's part of the project we're studying. So you actually, you can say something about this and find the roll time and so forth. Not a big deal. But uh, let me just finish before I, I have already run out of time. But let me just uh, say, just one second. If, if I finish and then you can ask them this, so that at least the blame of running over is not coming on to you. <laughs> so, um, so what was I going to say? Um, 
Okay, I think uh, I lost thread of what I wanted to say, but anyhow, so this is, let me just end by saying that these kind of questions about non supersymmetric case are crucial. I think we have enough examples in string theory that we should get some insights. We should not take, I would like to impart this message to you guys, don't take for granted if somebody says, oh, there's a huge number of things, just do this or that. Don't believe effective field theories in string theory unless they actually show it to you because we have counterexamples. And so, oh yeah, I wanted, I, I wanted to say the following. There's actually another reason to believe this doesn't exist, this dissenter. Even though this is again not a proof, this is actually the following. It says, well, each time you're trying to do this kind of metastable vacuum, there's some direction you have forgotten. For example, in string theory, anytime you have this, there's a string coupling constant. So that's the kind of the dyne cyber type argument. How do you stabilize the string coupling constant and so forth? That's the kind of a problem. So you say, okay, don't forget about string theory. Go to M theory. It has no coupling constant. Use that. Okay, Maldacena and Nunes studied that. They found that if effective supergravity, if you take the supergravity limit where the Planckian effects are not important, there's a no-go theorem. You cannot get this there from M theory. Okay? Is that a conspiracy or just happens because they just impose that you want the weak gravity so the Planckian effects are suppressed? You know, this is called R squared type correction, higher order correction, that goes away. But leading normal effective field theory, there's a general argument, no matter what manifold you choose, you cannot get this there space from M theory. These kind of things suggest to me that we should take seriously the idea that this is not part of the string landscape. So I'm willing, well, I'm, I'm not at the point willing to conjecture as a tenth one or something that the, the visitor space that belongs to the swamp land. But at that point, I'll stop. Thank you. Yeah, so you can, there's one, there's one, if you try to get uh, 10 from brains in string theory, that's, the, that's one line. But you could say that 10 might work without string theory. In other words, you, but I was using that, but 10 could stand on its own also, independently of 9. So there's one, one context that 10 cannot exist in the context of string theory. The other thing says, no, no, what about other contexts? Yeah. It's analogous to your other question, whether there might be a completely different way of getting the sitter, anti the sitter from this, from other than string theory. Yeah, could, could could have, but in all constructions we know of getting holographies, brains are involved. I don't know any other. If you know, let me know. I always we put brains in some geometry. So if you take that, then it's then it is follows from that. Yes. In some sense, all of them do show up in IR if you allow black hole as part of the mode of thinking. Without black holes, you cannot. So if you allow like Hawking radiation and this and that, yes. So it depends on what you mean by IR. IR of just field theory without gravity, no. But, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that, I think as, as, as you saw, many of them are based in relation to, to contradictions in the context of black holes. So I suspect that all of them, in some ways, are understandable. I don't want to be in a situation where all of them remain incomprehensible. As I try to say that there are, there are evidence, there are reasons for some of them. So yes, I hope that there would be effective arguments, but now you have to use black holes or such objects from gravity. That's right. Effective field theory combined with black holes must be the key. At least a piece of it. Whether that's enough or not, I don't know. Sorry? Well, there's a relation about the rate of emission if the number of species goes up. So the, temp the, the emission is proportional to the temperature which is related also to the number of particles, right? You can have a huge number of them, then it radiates too fast or something. So there are people who have talked about the species problem in the context of black hole. But this does not give you a sharp bound. So I, I, I said it in passing. I don't think that's the real reason. At least I don't see how to make that precise. So I, I'd rather not get into the speculating it. Yes? Uh, I go back to number seven. Yes? Uh, so you said that uh, I want to buy my book. Yes. But you allowed for punctures. 
Yeah, so I said that by that I mean modular those, yes, if you fill them, so to speak. Yeah, so the statement here is that if you allow these points, which are infinite far away points, if you collapse them to points, there's no other, let me say, there's no other pi 1 other than these, let me say that. So in other words, the pi 1s are generated precisely by points, that's another way of saying it. Pi 1s are generated precisely by points where t goes to infinity. Stringy cosmology, or would be stringy, or wishful stringy cosmology, which one? I think if it's stringy cosmology, I cannot be against it, because string theory is string theory. So I would say that people who hope to get certain in string cosmology, but it's not really part of string theory. So people are, have string-motivated cosmology, I would say. Many of the string-motivated cosmology I doubt exist, actually. They, I think they have been a bit loose with what actually can be constructed in string theory. I'm a bit skeptical. People have been, pe people have been in wishing to try to connect to the universe, have made this many assumptions. And I, I rather go back to constructing examples, and I think that's what I'm having difficulty understanding in these models. They make many assumptions, which are uh, in the context that they are dealing with is, is suspect. Um, are all these statements uh, specific 4D or 3D? Oh, no, no, this was any dimension. Sorry. I, uh, somewhat, sometimes I say take 4D just, just to focus our universe, but no, it's, it's more general. Yes, yes. I would say this will rule out the, the, the well, it rules out both of them. ADS non superstition is ruled out by the weak gravity kind of sharpened version of it. And the other one I'm just I'm on a limb and trying to say it because it's case against I don't have strong evidence yet. No, but the, 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 the they had different versions, I think. They had different I think the ones that they prefer is Yes. No, I know, but but before they lift it up, they start with something super symmetric. They have different. They might have different versions. I, I, I think the the, the the version that he's right. The version that they actually I talked talk, talk with Shamit about this quite a bit. The version that they like is the one he just said, namely that the, you start with a supersymmetric ADS and you just uplift it by putting anti D three. That's the that's the. Immediately becomes positive. Yes. 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 Sure. Thank you.